At elevations between 900 and 1400 meters, one comes across the cedar or Cedrus brevifolia, which is also the only tree endemic to Cyprus. This is one of the four species of cedar found throughout the world. A long-lived tree which can reach 500 years in age, it's encountered in abundance only in the Paphos forest and particularly in the Tripilos area, which, like so many other parts of the Trodos Mountains, lends itself to excellent walks where one is easily impressed by the majestic landscape and the beauty of the cedar, a protected species since 1878. <laughs> The Trodos Massif has a significant effect on climatologic conditions and particularly rainfall. The tectonic activity which accompanied the formation of the mountains also caused the spallation of the rock formations themselves, rendering them permeable to water and resulting in the creation of aquifers and the emergence of natural springs at various elevations. It was these springs which in days of old and during normal winters fed most of the island's rivers, even during the dry months, ensuring a constant flow which powered the island's water mills, the ruins of which can be seen in many areas of the island and exceed 215 in number. The Russian monk and traveller Basil Barsky, who visited Cyprus in 1735, mentions. Let it be known that there are many small rivers in Cyprus, the largest of these being seven or eight and arising from the imposing mountain of Trodos. They power many mills and yield great profit through the watering of trees and crops, after which they pour into the sea. The smaller of these rivers do not pour into the sea, but sink underground and disappear in the depths of the earth. Today, most of the rain falling on Trodos flows on its surface in rivers originating in the massif itself, irrigating fields, enriching coastal aquifers, and filling the island's dams, which have a total capacity of 310 million cubic meters of water. The eastern Mediterranean is characterized by a dry climate and semi-arid regions, both of which limit agricultural production and, as a result, living and cultural standards. Even though in this very area of the planet, Cyprus is characterized by a climate presenting large regional variations during the same time period, and this because of the Trodos Massif, whose rainfall significantly increases the water balance of the island, transforming through the diversion and channeling of water large flatlands into irrigable fields even during the dry season. As Euripides very appropriately observed and described in Bacchae in 408 BC, Oh, were I to be in Paphos, where the hundred springed river flows, running through and nourishing the land when it does not rain. The variety of terrains and microclimates formed by the rise of the Trodos Mountains is reflected in the large variety of crops and orchards. Vineyards as well as carob and olive trees have been a staple for the residents of the island from Neolithic times to this day. As regards fruit in particular, one need only travel a short distance to see subtropical varieties such as bananas, mango and avocado, as well as citrus fruit, succeeding those of colder climates such as cherries, plums and apples.
One of the epithets attributed by ancients to Cyprus was forest clad, and this because all its mountainous areas as well as other expanses were indeed covered by dense forests due to the climatologic and geologic conditions created through the differential uplift of Trodos and which also facilitate the fast regeneration of forests every 50 or so years, a phenomenon which one can easily observe in and around the abandoned open-pit copper mines of the 1950s and 60s. The 50-year life cycle of forests provided the large amounts of wood which helped keep alive the island's high-in-energy demand copper mining industry in antiquity. Copper mining continues to this day, albeit only at the Skuriodisa mine, probably the oldest and at the same time longest in operation copper mine in the world. The significance of mining in Cyprus is huge, given that it provided thousands of workers with their daily bread in difficult times, limited emigration, helped establish the island's union movement, but above all, acted as the main catalyst for the technological upgrading of Cyprus. The Trodos Ophiolite Massif is listed among the five richest in copper areas of the world per unit of surface. The copper-bearing deposits were formed at the same time as the lavas on the bottom of the sea during the underwater volcanic activity. The raising of Trodos and the subsequent erosion brought them to the surface, resulting in their oxidation and acquisition of intense colours, an attribute which contributed to their prompt location and exploitation by the ancients. Στα προϊόντα της οξύδωσης των χαλκούχων κυρασμάτων της Κύπρου περιλαμβάνονται ένιδρα θυγικά άλατα του χαλκού, του σιδήλου και του ψευδαργύρου. Οι αντισηπτικές και επιλωτικές ιδιότητες των οποίων διαπιστώθηκαν πολύ νωρίς από τους αρχαίους μεταλλορίχους και χρησιμοποιήθηκαν αργότερα σαν φάρμακα από τους αρχαίους γιατρούς. Ο Διοσκουρίδης αναφέρει 16 ορυκτά φάρμακα από τα μανίλια της Κύπρου, ενώ ο Πλίνιος και ο Γαλινός περιγράφουν τις εξαιρετικές ιδιότητες αυτών των φαρμάκων, ιδιαίτερα του Χαλκανθού της Κύπρου και τα κατέστησαν περιζήτητα σε ολόκληρη την Ρωμαϊκή Αυτοκρατορία. Πλήθος αρχαιολογικών ευρημάτων, αρχαίων κειμένων, επιγραφών και αφιερωμάτων, καθώς επίσης ένας μακρύς κατάλογος καταξιωμένων γιατρών αποτελούν πιστική μαρτυρία ότι στην αρχαία Κύπρο υπήρχε μια εξαιρετική παράδοση άσκησης και μάθησης της ιατρικής επιστήμης η οποία ξεκίνησε από τον Ωνάσυλο τον 4ο τον 5ο π.Χ. αιώνα και τέλειωσε τον 4ο μετά τον αιώνα με τον Σύνονα τον Κιτιαία. Ο Στράβωνας αναφέρει ότι στην Κύπρο από το θυκό χαλκό κατασκεύαζε το Μελάνι, ενώ στην αρχαία αραβική γραμματεία υπάρχουν ε, συνταγέ στι οποίε περιγράφεται ο τρόπο που οι αρχαίοι Κύπροι κατασκεύαζαν το Μελάνι από το θυκό χαλκό και τα φυτά του τρόδου. Abandoned mines, photographs and memories is all that remains from the modern exploitation of copper in Cyprus, a practice which began with the onset of the 20th century and which essentially ended with the Turkish invasion of 1974. A similar picture is presented at the asbestos mine. This is the largest asbestos deposit in Europe, covering an area of some 13 square miles. Cyprus asbestos was known from the classical period of Greece. From references by both Dioscurides and Apollonius, asbestos as a fibrous mineral was used in the making of shrouds, wicks, footwear and other items. Large-scale modern exploitation of asbestos began in 1904 when the mineral first began to be used, mixed in with cement, in the manufacture of asbestos plates and bricks. Serious environmental problems and the drop in the price of asbestos led to the closing of the mine in 1982. There were times when Amiantos was a well-organized urban center. Characteristically, it's mentioned that in 1928, more than 9,000 workers along with their families were employed at the asbestos mine and that a total of 38,000 children were born at the local hospital during all its years of operation. 
Northwest of Cacopetria, in an idyllic landscape, one comes across the abandoned installations of the island's chromite mines. Nature spared no expense when endowing the Ophiolithic complex with rich deposits of metallurgical and refractory chromite, the exploitation of which began in 1924 and ended in 1984 because of a fall in demand and prices. The Trodos rock formations, volcanic and sedimentary, constituted and still constitute the prime source of stone, that most ancient of building materials used extensively throughout the history of mankind. In Cyprus, stone has been a basic building material from Neolithic times to the present. Initially, as one can observe in the Neolithic settlement of Hirogitia, the main source of building stones were the beds of rivers, in whose drainage basins one finds the most resilient rocks. Throughout the ages, Cypriots made use of building stones available in their immediate environs. The various settlements, especially the rural ones, are in complete and total harmony with the colorings, the geomorphology and the environment in general because they're built using construction materials obtained from the area around them. The settlements appear to grow from the earth itself and are as one with the landscape. In each and every village, the buildings, the cobbled streets and the stonework reflect the geology and petrology of the region. Even in the lowlands, rocks from the Trodos Mountains were used, given that these were brought down by the rivers and deposited along the river beds. Here, however, we observe a mixed building technique, with the Trodos rocks used as foundations and mud brick construction above ground. In other areas, the lower part of the edifice is built using rocks from Trodos and chalk-based building materials, given that both of these are found in abundance in the immediate environs. In the semi-mountainous areas surrounding the main bulk of the Trodos massif, such as in the vicinity of the village of Lefkara, one encounters the type of rock known as cherts. Rocks, which due to their hardness were used by humans of the Neolithic age to light fire, make tools and, until the very recent past, in the making of threshing tools or boards. Cherts are sedimentary rocks and appear in layers, resulting in them being extracted as slabs, a fact which, along with their hardness, renders them excellent building materials. In the semi-mountainous regions of the Limassol district, one comes across a compact yellowish-white calcareous sandstone used extensively as a building material in ancient monuments, such as those of Alassa, Curium, the Sanctuary of Apollo Hylates, Colossi Castle, Limassol Fort, and the Ayir Napa Church in Limassol Town. This rock, better known locally as Kivides stone, is much sought after even today, not only in Cyprus, but also abroad, where it's exported and used mainly as a decorative stone. In Nicosia and its environs, the stone used extensively as a building material was calcareous sandstone. The quarrying of this stone was carried out underground, and the well-known caves around Lefkosia at Ayaparaskevi, Aglancha, Acropolis, Yerolakos and Mamari are testament to the practice. Βρισκόμαστε στα εβόγια λαντομία του χωριού Μαμάρι. Μέσα σε κάθε λαντομία υπήρχαν πολλά μέτωπα εξόρυξης και κάθε πετροκόπος είχε το δικό του μέτωπο εξόρυξης από το οποίο αποσπούσε ένα κομμάτι πετρώματος που είχε διαστάσει σε ένα με 1,5 μέτρο σε πλάτος και γύρω στα 2 μέτρα σε ύψος. 
Κάθε χαρακιά που βλέπουμε στα τυχώματα είναι και ένα χτύπημα τη αξίνα με την οποία έσκαβαν περιφερειακά το κομμάτι για να το αποσπάσουν. Πρώτα έσκαβαν τι δύο οριζόντιε πλευρέ που ήταν γνωστέ σαν πάνω και κάτω δόμα στη γλώσσα του και τη μία.